So thank you very much, Pano, for the kind introduction. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk today about the ecosystems of technological innovation. Uh, some key lectures from key lectures from around the world. I will try to introduce some concepts and uh, give some ideas. Uh, when time's up, tell me to stop because sometimes I start talking and I never stop. So. Uh, recently, uh, there was this announcement in, uh, in the news here in Cyprus. Uh, uh, for those of you that uh, don't speak Greek, please uh, bear with us for, for a moment. Uh, about uh, a public uh, consultation regarding uh, the development of a science park in uh, a very nice area uh, uh, which is called Pendacomo, which uh, is more or less in the middle of nowhere for Cypriot uh, uh, distances. It's between, uh, between Limassol and Nicosia. Uh, and uh, if you have some uh, uh, ideas about how this uh, science park should be developed, etc., you can go to this uh, system uh, from the Ministry of uh, uh, Commerce and uh, add uh, comments. Okay, so this is the address. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the effort here is to, to build a, a science park, uh, a science technology park, and uh, the deadline is uh, just a couple of days. Uh, from today. Okay, H have you heard of uh, the science park uh, in Pendacomo, this uh, story? Uh, no. Okay. And this is uh, something that I found on the internet. Uh, it's, uh, I guess, how they envision uh, this uh, science park will uh, uh, develop, which looks uh, very nice. Pendacomo is a very nice area. Now, one would say, okay, why? Uh, why do we need a science park? Uh, usually you see these announcements and they come with a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm or maybe hype, uh, but you have to always ask uh, why. Uh, why do we need this? Uh, maybe there are very good reasons, but maybe not. We don't know. Uh, we have to, un to understand uh, what is involved. And uh, if we are uh, persuaded that, yes, uh, we need the science technology park, then the next question is, what? what's the next question? It's how, all right? Okay, yeah, if we are convinced that we need the science park, how do we build one? How do we make one, all right? So let's uh, first uh, look at the why. Um, and this is a long story I'm going to say. Uh, and along this uh, story, I will uh, just try to, to introduce uh, some uh, uh, concepts uh, since it's the beginning of the semester. Uh, for some of you, these concepts uh, may be useful. For those of you that take the, MI, uh, the AI entrepreneurship course, maybe you have heard it again, but uh, that's okay. Anyway, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, okay? Uh, just raise your hand. Uh, it's better to have like interactive discussion than uh, me talking. So, uh, to answer the why, one would tell you, look, uh, this is what happens around the world. I mean, if you go around the world, in uh, different countries, in different areas, in different uh, continents, uh, there are science technology parks. You have uh, in Sofia Antipolis in, in France a uh, technology park, a technology pole is called uh, the French uh, terminology, which is there for now uh, over 30 years. Uh, you have the tech city in uh, London, Presto, um, in the UK. Uh, you have uh, uh, the park of the National University of Singapore. You have also this kind of uh, activities, operations in Qatar, uh, in Dubai, 
in Saudi Arabia, uh, in New York City with Cornell, in uh, uh, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, uh, and so on. So one would say, yeah, I mean, these people are not crazy. They know something, so let's do this here, right? So uh, this is not, in my opinion, a very good answer uh, because uh, this is uh, the concept that drives such an answer. You know what is FOMO, right? Do you know what FOMO means, the acronym? Yeah. Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. OK, so the others do it. We should do the same thing, OK? Uh, never do that. Uh, you have to, to know uh, why you are doing what you are doing, especially uh, if you are interested in entrepreneurship. So that's not a good enough reason. It's a reason that tells you, well, yeah, we have to at least understand what's going on. All right? So if we go to uh, back to the library, since we are in the library, and then uh, we start looking at uh, economics uh, books and what economists say about uh, activities going on typically in uh, science, technology, innovation parks, uh, then we will definitely uh, reach the work of uh, Robert Solo uh, from MIT, who was Nobel Prize in Economics in 1987, who made a career studying the importance of uh, innovation and its impact in the economy. And uh, basically, the conclusion of uh, a lot of his work and theory uh, was that technological innovation is the ultimate source of productivity. This is, of course, uh, I mean, it seems obvious, but for an economist to prove something, it takes a lot of effort and uh, needs a lot of data and uh, very solid uh, theoretical uh, uh, grounding. Okay? So, uh, one would say, yes, uh, science parks, uh, they deal with technology, with innovation, and, you know, productivity is something that it means that uh, we can produce things, uh, more things, with less uh, effort, right? Productivity is something good. And um, I mean, this is also uh, what other economists say. OECD is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's an international organization by, based in, uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. Where in one report, which is already eight years old, they say that now more than ever, productivity is the main driver of future growth and prosperity. So what this says is that, well, uh, I mean, we need to improve our productivity to be able to provide to our society, to our citizens, to our fellow uh, humans, uh, economic growth and prosperity. So if we don't uh, have productivity, if, if productivity drops, then, I mean, uh, things can deteriorate because, I mean, our prosperity may be in danger, okay? Um, another uh, quote from uh, Peter Thiel and Blake Masters in this uh, book, Zero to One. This is a very nice book. It's a small book about entrepreneurship. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. It's easy to read. Well, they say that without new technology, globalization is unsustainable in a world of scarce resources. So this adds another dimension on why we need technological innovation. Uh, you know, uh, we have to somehow... Uh, try to, uh, to, to achieve these kind of activities. Because, I mean, uh, globalization uh, changes a lot of things uh, about the economy and how economies work and how economies compete in a globalized environment where we have uh, facilities for transporting goods and uh, uh, other things uh, more easily from uh, distant places, and moreover, uh, we can 
uh, also export services uh, instantly over the internet. Okay, and this is uh, not sustainable in a world where uh, resources are scarce. And we understand what uh, scarce resources mean uh, because, I mean, uh, for instance, with the war in Ukraine, uh, Europe realized that uh, natural gas, which was abundant and very cheap, became just in a matter of a few weeks a scarce resource and uh, that had a lot of uh, consequences. So innovation is important, uh, new technology is important uh, to sustain uh, growth, to sustain a globalized uh, economy with all the positive aspects that the globalization brings and I think it's a logical step to uh, realize what they say here uh, that who gets to control innovation is a central question of our time. Okay, so uh, innovation is not something that uh, we get from the air. Uh, uh, this suggests that innovation is something that can be controlled. And controlling something means that you can protect it, uh, you can t take advantage of it, and you can make sure that others uh, don't have it somehow or cannot take advantage because well after all we live in a competitive world okay so uh, if you live in a country that is not uh, very much advanced in terms of innovation and uh, uh, in terms of technology and science you say yeah of course we know that so yeah we need to be concerned uh, we have to think about it, uh, understand how we do it, because there are these big forces in the world uh, that they control innovation, uh, that's their game, and uh, you know they can prosper, whereas our uh, living standards uh, can be threatened. Well, it turns out that even in these uh, countries, and the most innovative uh, Country, the most progressed country in terms of science and technology is the United States. If you, will see, if you see, there are a lot of uh, books and reports coming now out from uh, various uh, people, uh, from the National Academies of Science and Engineering to people who were in the military to people who are in technology and in policy making. They are concerned. They are concerned how uh, the United States can. Uh, maintain their uh, uh, innovation power. So how can they uh, keep controlling uh, uh, innovation? A large part of what uh, innovative uh, results uh, come out. Okay? So these are all very nice books. I mean, this is a bit old, closing the innovation gap. Uh, Judy Estrin uh, was in the board of uh, Disney, and uh, she's talking about the innovation gap, and the gap is what? It's the gap between the United States of the uh, early 21st century and the United States of the 1950s, okay? And this is a very nice uh, book from uh, Admiral uh, James Tavridis, who was like uh, the, the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO in, uh, in Europe, which is 2034. It talks about a war between uh, the United States and China, uh, which is won uh, by China uh, without uh, even uh, firing a shot through uh, cyber attacks on American fleets. Okay. So this is this is a concern not only for small countries, not only for countries that are not so much so advanced, but also for countries uh, that are very much advanced. And that's why many governments around the world are looking to technology innovation as a driver for national economic growth and that's why even in Cyprus uh, you know, the, the government is doing this uh, public uh, discussion about establishing a, a science and technology park. There are also other, um, other reasons and other uh, uh, testimonies that uh, innovation is very important. Uh, this is uh, from uh, uh, European Communities Report 2012. Uh, 
you were very young at the time, but uh, I mean, Europe uh, entered a very serious uh, um, crisis, economic, uh, financial crisis around that time. And uh, a lot of countries faced uh, serious uh, problems, especially countries in the south, like Greece, like Cyprus, etc. And what they noticed here, uh, the analysts of the European Commission, is that there is a strike, strikingly strong correlation between R&D spending in the EU in the period 2004 and 2009 and economic growth in 2011. What this tells us is that, I mean, uh, if we are talking, uh, usually, you know, we are discussing uh, even in politics about what happens today, what happened last year, what hap will happen next year. In reality, what happens now or next year has been uh, determined to a largest extent f on what we did like five or ten years ago. All right? So uh, if you want to change the game, you have to do something now so that you have an impact like five years or ten years from now. This is how it works. And this is what this says. Okay? There is another interesting um, uh, observation I found uh, uh, in this uh, <coughs> book from Haskell and Westlake. These are economists uh, from the UK. Uh, they refer to some uh, study that was done on the German Mittelstand, which is Germany's uh, country of profitable, globally competitive, medium-sized uh, manufacturing businesses, uh, which is like the uh, the foundation of the uh, German economy. You know, Germany has a lot of uh, uh, small and medium businesses that are uh, very strong uh, uh, globally. Uh, they are not like huge companies necessarily, but they are small companies that export, uh, manufacture and export everywhere. So this study showed that uh, the sources of their profitability include the commitment to research, development, innovation, strong and durable information-rich relationships with suppliers and customers, and excellent workforce skills and organization. Okay? So, let's see now some key concepts uh, that uh, can help us uh, explore the question of uh, why we need a, um, a science park, if we need it, and how we can uh, make it happen. So the, I mean, the terms is, uh, that I'm going to discuss about them is invention, in Greek epinoisi, innovation, in Greek kenotomia, entrepreneurship, epihirmatikotita, uh, disruption, anatropy, intangibles, highly economia, and ecosystem. Okay? Let's start with invention and innovation, because uh, at the root of innovation, uh, we have inventions. We have uh, what is an invention is something new, anything novel. It could be scientific, technological, it could be socio-political, uh, including economics, it could be humanistic or cultural. So, uh, at the core of what we are discussing here lies uh, the capability of people uh, to come up with uh, novel ideas. Okay, and some of these ideas can be patented uh, they result into intellectual property uh, that can be somehow exploited, but not all of them, okay? Not all inventions can be patented, not all inventions are necessarily uh, completely novel. They could be novel in a given context, in a given uh, socio-economic, historical context. Not all of them uh, lead to industrial applications, but, I mean, there are uh, they represent the core, the, the seed for building uh, innovative uh, products and activities, etc. Uh, the second term is innovation. So what is innovation? According to an ISO definition, uh, International Standards Organization, it's ISO. Uh, innovation is a new or changed entity which creates or uh, redistributes value. So value is a term that we will keep seeing here. Innovation means uh, something original and effective, which creates value, including the creation not only of new products, but also of new markets, of new needs, of new business models. And this involves the practical implementation of an invention to have uh, impact in a market or in a society. 
Okay, so that's a definition. If someone asks you uh, what is innovation, this is like a formal way to describe uh, what we are talking about. And you see that the creation of value uh, and um, the, uh, the release of this value to some society is at the core of, that, of, this, uh, of this term. Now, uh, invention may or may not result in innovation. So uh, inventions, novelties, don't necessarily create value uh, at the time when uh, they are created. And innovation does not strictly need an invention. So sometimes, you know, innovations rely on things that have been already invented. And uh, you can, at some stage, someone can recognize the value that they can bring, and then they take advantage of them. Another uh, definition for innovation, this is from a book that we use in the, uh, in the course, um, Discipline Entrepreneurship from uh, MIT, Bill Owlett. Innovation is defined as the product of invention times commercialization. As you understand, this is uh, like an abstract uh, uh, equation. It's not something that you can plug in some numbers and you say, okay, this is innovation. But, I mean, this equation wants to convey to you uh, some uh, simple message about uh, what innovation means. Can you see what is the message here that we get out of this equation? Well, uh, we need to actually uh, magnify commercialization in order to have a big, in order for the innovation to have a big impact. Yeah, uh, but you can also say that for invention as well, right? If you have yes. to. But there is something else which is related to what you what you said, uh, which is more uh, uh, straightforward, going the other direction. If one of these factors is zero, then there is no innovation. Namely, to have innovation, if there is no commercialization, if this is zero, I mean, the innovation is not there. If there is no invention, that's zero again. Innovation doesn't, uh, is, it doesn't uh, occur. Okay, that's the, the message that they want to convey uh, with this simple equation. Now, how do we get inventions through scientific and technological advancement? This is where interesting things happen, typically, but not ex uh, exclusively, as we said. And where do we get commercialization from? Commercialization, typically, we get it uh, from entrepreneurship, OK? Uh, so invention may or may not result in innovation. As we said, innovation does not strictly need uh, needs an invention. And what is entrepreneurship? Uh, if you uh, look at Wikipedia, then we'll tell you that entrepreneurship is the creation or extraction of economic value. Value again, economic value more specifically. And entrepreneurship is viewed as change, generally entailing risk beyond what is normally encountered if you start a business. For instance, you may start a baker's uh, shop. Okay, the baker is business, but it's not necessary entrepreneurship because it's something that everybody understands how it works okay uh, which may include other values than simply economic ones so sometimes entrepreneurship doesn't uh, uh, try to achieve economic value but other values uh, like uh, for instance addressing addressing societal uh, problems okay and this is another term from, uh, again, these guys at the MIT, that uh, entrepreneurship is the formation of a new venture that produces a product or offering that creates some value, value again, for which uh, your new ve venture can capture some value. So you create value, and uh, that's not enough. You want also to capture some of the value for yourself, for your venture, so that it is economically sustainable. OK? It's not just a giveaway. So uh, entrepreneurship uh, can be uh, further uh, defined as the entrepreneurship that happens in SMEs, small and medium enterprises, uh, which typically have a local market focus, typically but not uh, everywhere. The, the German example 
uh, was not local before. But typically, I mean, this is the entrepreneurship that you have with restaurants, uh, dry cleaners, some services, some consultancies, what have you. And then there is the other entrepreneurship for which, I mean, we're going to, uh, to put our emphasis uh, today, which is innovation-driven enterprises, uh, which typically they have a global market focus and they have products with innovation at their core, okay? So in this uh, type of entrepreneurship, usually the revenue, the cash flow, and the jobs uh, is uh, linear with time, uh, so they don't really expand very much. Uh, in, uh, and this happens in uh, a relatively short time frame. So if you open a bakery, okay, it has to bring uh, some fro profits uh, within a year or so. Okay, you cannot keep investing to make the bakery successful and sustainable for five years or uh, 10 years. And then you have the uh, innovation-driven enterprises where, I mean, the, uh, here this, uh, 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 this function of revenue or cash flow or jobs with time is completely uh, different. So, you know, when you start, you start losing money uh, you don't have any income, uh, you don't have a strong revenue, but if you are successful after a certain point, you have uh, this kind of curve, which is, uh, how do we uh, describe this kind of curves? Do you recognize them? That's the best situation you can get into if you have a startup. This is an exponential curve, right? So you, you want to have an exponential increase in revenue, uh, in cash flows, in growth in general. And this is what we see in startups uh, that was Google uh, many years ago and Facebook and so on and so forth. So we are going to uh, talk more about uh, innovation-driven enterprises. This is, I mean, the, uh, the emphasis here. And another term for entrepreneurship is that this is the principal mechanism through which developed and developing economies can take advantage of inventions and manage to evolve and regenerate. So that's why uh, entrepreneurship is very important because, yes, uh, you may have an innovative uh, society that uh, invents a lot of things, that uh, they create innovations, but entrepreneurship is this uh, mechanism that brings uh, innovations into the economy and allows uh, for innovation to help the economy progress, to improve productivity and bring economic growth uh, and uh, prosperity. Okay, and there are a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, I guess papers and analysis uh, by economists uh, who demonstrate uh, that this is in, indeed true. So this is a uh, nice study from the United States Census Bureau where they looked at uh, how startups in the United States um, impacted the job market. So there, uh, out of their statistical uh, analysis, they found that without startups, the net rate of increase in employment in the U.S. between 1990 and 2005 would have been negative, namely the United States economy uh, would have uh, would not have created new jobs. Uh, the jobs would have, the number of jobs would have dropped. Okay. Now, uh, so we saw uh, some uh, definition of innovation as invention times commercialization. We said that uh, okay, invention comes from scientific technological advancement. Commercialization deals with entrepreneurship. What is the common uh, factor? for invention and commercialization. The common factor is that they require highly specialized human capital. Okay, in order to uh, create inventions uh, through scientific technological advancement, you need uh, people who are really talented in science, technology, uh, in uh, business modeling, in process engineering, whatever. And uh, this also uh, goes, uh, holds for entrepreneurship you need uh, very strong uh, human capital. 
Now, let's see another term that is uh, very often heard when uh, you go to these events about startups, etc. is disruption. Okay? How do we disrupt and what is disruption? So there is this uh, theory about disruptive innovation uh, by Clayton Christensen, who uh, was a professor, I think, at Harvard uh, Business School, uh, who died recently. Uh, so he, he has written uh, very nice books about disruptive innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, very interesting to, to read uh, if you have time. So according to uh, Christensen, disruption describes a process whereby a smaller company with fewer resources is able to challenge an established incumbent business. So you have a startup uh, which is small, it doesn't have the, the money of uh, IBM or Google or Facebook, but it somehow manages to disrupt the operation of these uh, big companies by offering something new, okay, something different, or uh, uh, identifying some uh, new need. Uh, so disruptive innovation is the, the innovation that creates a new market and value network or enters at the bottom of an existing market and eventually displaces established firms. Okay? So the innovator's DNA is, uh, I mean, these books are very nice, so you don't need to be an economist to, to read them. Uh, they have a lot of uh, very useful insights. And by the way, if you are interested in entrepreneurship, one thing that you need to do for sure is to read a lot. Okay, every entrepreneur will tell you that. Don't take my word for it because I'm not an entrepreneur. Now, do we know of any uh, disruptive innovations? This is um, a very uh, well-known and typical example uh, that uh, did not exist in the pockets of uh, billions of people around the world in before 2007, and now everyone has one with them, okay? So and that's what uh, Steve Jobs uh, said about his uh, ambition, his vision was we were here to make a dent in the universe and this is something that he really uh, achieved uh, in doing. Now what are the sources of disruption? Uh, how can we disrupt uh, some uh, existing company, some uh, existing uh, marketplace, what are the basic sources of disruption? I would uh, propose that uh, the, the source of disruption is uh, ideas and needs, okay? Now, and if you go to the history of uh, the iPhone, according to uh, this uh, report by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, there are a lot of ideas uh, from uh, electrical engineering, microelectronics, computer science, computer engineering, uh, manufacturing, etc., that somehow led to the creation of this iPhone. So, and it's not uh, Steve Jobs and Apple that did all these inventions and all these innovations. They were somehow performed by through a long period of time. And uh, somehow Apple and Steve Jobs uh, were able to put these things together uh, and give you a product that met a certain need that uh, was not necessarily recognized at the time of their offering. Okay? And it's very well known, I mean, when these results uh, came out uh, in science. However, uh, you know, the uh, the the, the, uh, the the things that drive a disruption uh, sometimes they come uh, in places and in uh, in ways that you cannot uh, foresee. Uh, so I mean I don't know if you recognize this. Uh, who are uh, the people in this uh, in this image? Do you, there is a story uh, behind this, so do you uh, recognize these people? Yeah. Uh, no, 
buttons. Okay, but you, you, if you remember the name, at least you remember one of the names. If you remember the story. The left one is uh, Alexander the Great. So this is Alexander. Okay. One is, uh, this is Diogenes. The guy that. Uh, so Diogenes was a philosopher. Uh, and uh, he was a philosopher who was living in uh, Corinth in this uh, barrel. He was going around uh, naked or half naked. And uh, he was famous. So when Alexander uh, reached Corinth, uh, when he started conquering uh, the rest of Greece, uh, he, he went and saw uh, Diogenes and asked him, uh, what do you want? What can I offer you? So you had the, I mean, on, on the one side, you had like the uh, strongest uh, military and political uh, leader, uh, not of just his time, but I mean of a millennium perhaps, uh, standing in front of this uh, old, uh, uh, old fellow and asking him, what do you want? Uh, so, uh, what was the reply of Diogenes? Uh, uh, Just uh, leave, uh, let me, let the sun... Uh, yes. Stand out of my light. Stand out. Okay? Because you are uh, casting your shadow. And me and I want just to uh, relax and uh, warm from the sun. Okay? And, uh, okay, the, the entourage of uh, Alexander, his uh, bodyguards, etc., start laughing uh, and uh, mocking him. Uh, so Alexander said, yes, yes, but you know, uh, if I were not Alexander, uh, I would like to be uh, Diogenes, okay? So they were uh, mocking, we are so strong, and he ignores you. This guy ignores you. Yes, but, you know. Uh, so, what is the, the, the conclusion out of, uh, of this story? I mean, why do I put this story here? It's a nice story, but what is the conclusion? Uh, the conclusion is that uh, uh, what drives really innovation and the need, the need to innovate, to produce, etc., is human needs. So, if you have a person that doesn't care or, or doesn't need what you are offering, uh, your offer is basically uh, has no value. Okay. So what Alexander was able to offer to the Eugenics had no value for the Eugenics. And this is a very uh, important force. <coughs> now here we have another story about disruption, another disruptive story. Uh, Diogenes was disrupted in the sense that he affected philosophy and uh, things that came after Alexander, etc. That's another story. Do you recognize uh, the people uh, in this uh, uh, painting? So, uh, this is uh, Martin Luther. Okay, Martin Luther was a priest and uh, a teacher who at some point uh, got fed up with uh, the business model of the Catholic Church. Uh, in reality, he was bothered by uh, the theological, uh, uh, the lack of uh, theological uh, of respect to you know, uh, Christianity principles by the Catholic Church, and he went and <coughs> published 95 positions about uh, the church. And uh, why this was disruptive? Uh, it was uh, disruptive because it created the, the reformation and the, the wars that uh, came with the reformation and disrupted the Catholic Church. And behind this, I mean, this is an interesting story. Uh, why? Because the Catholic Church had a business model to collect money and the business model know what was the business model? <coughs> they sold uh, the uh, 
uh, how they say the indulgences, the sikolokhartia in Greek. So if you were a sinner, uh, the judge would tell you, don't worry. We will sell you uh, a paper stating that you are absolved from your sins. So you pay money and you get this absolution. So you are a sinner no more. If you sin again, that's okay. We sell you another paper and then you are home free. And the business model is, well, they needed the money to, the Pope needed the money to build St. Peter in order to demonstrate, you know, the through human uh, art, etc., architecture, the power of the church and the philosophy of the church. Uh, that was expensive. Well, uh, since he had the monopoly of uh, absolution, he had to delegate it to local uh, bishops and archbishops, and then to collect the money in order to pay the debt to the investor, to the Pope, while they were going around uh, with marketing of the time to sell these papers. And uh, Martin Luther was, uh, rightly so, uh, very much upset about this, because it was, uh, what, it was really a mockery of uh, the Christian faith. Okay, so what is the uh, lesson here? Again, uh, why people purchased these uh, papers? Would you go and buy a paper absolving your sins? Would you spend, how much money would you spend now? Nothing? Yeah. What is the cost of producing such a, such a paper? At the time it was a bit expensive because they didn't have uh, laser printers, but now you know, it's uh, very cheap. Right, so do you, would you spend some money? No. Of course, there are people, you know, who are still willing to, uh, you know, spend money on this kind of, uh, of this. But I mean, most people don't do it. And why they don't do it? Because, in our mindset, we understand that this is a fraud. Okay, that the paper it cannot really relieve you from your sins. At the time, they believed it, and uh, you know, someone was making money. When. Uh, Luther came and said, well, this is bogus. Uh, a lot of the money was gone. You know, people stopped doing this. And the business model collapsed, uh, at least in certain areas of uh, Europe. And this created uh, war and a lot of conflicts because, you know, the uh, war is always about money. So uh, the need uh, is not necessarily uh, what we uh, need in order to, to feed ourselves or to be healthy or the need can be something completely uh, theoretical, psychological and a lot of companies today rely on these kind of needs. For instance, uh, social network platforms, okay. Instagram, etc. So the sources of disruption uh, are the needs, but also the ideas. Ideas come from scientific and technological progress. The needs come from, the real needs come from planetary scale uh, problems and challenges. And now let's see about ideas. Okay, so one would say that's uh, a nice uh, story that you are telling us, but uh, what's in it for us today? I mean, uh, is this relevant or not? And uh, the, the reality is, that we are uh, behind, the, the ideas come behind the scientific technological progress of the 21st century and we are witnessing a large scale revolution uh, that has been enabled by the emergence of next generation of innovation thanks to exponential advances in technology and science uh, in areas like computing, uh, big data, uh, AI, robotics, machine learning, renewable energy, materials, 3D printing, nanotechnology, genomics, biology, etc. All right? All these are very nice buzzwords. But let's see. Uh, is this true? Or I'm just, uh, you know, uh, uh, saying uh, buzzwords without uh, this uh, being real today, the, the society that we live. First of all, there is this. Uh, there was this nice uh, uh, 
a book uh, many years ago where they predicted something that occurs today. So they said, look, uh, the uh, knowledge creation, if, you, if we measure it uh, by the number of pages published in scientific journals, in 2007, I was doubling every seven years. We measure the pages of scientific journals. So this is something that we can measure. We go to the library, we get all the journals, and we look how many pages were published in 2007, how many in 2005, how many in 2000, how many in 2010, and so on. So they, uh, here they made this prediction that by 2030, uh, the number of pages would double every 72 days. And they also made this uh, corollary that, uh, well, this means that 80% of the knowledge required to uh, perform an advanced uh, technical job will be rendered obsolete in 10 years. So what you learn today, 80% of this in 10 years would be totally useless. Now, is it true? We see that uh, if you look at uh, uh, bibliometrics and uh, studies that you know measure uh, things, you will see that, yeah, in many areas this happens. So, for instance, this is from the State of AI report of 2020 and PubMed. They uh, counted the uh, publications involving AI methods in biology. AI methods meaning deep learning, NLP, computer vision, uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, they see that these this are growing 50% year on a year since 2017. So you see here some kind of exponential curve and that the papers published since 2019 account for 25% of all output since 2020. So, since 2000. So, these predictions that, uh, you know, the, the previous book did in 2007, somehow, uh, it's not bogus. And we see this in this area, and we see it in other areas, and uh, we will see more. And then, just opening in parentheses, besides this uh, scientific uh, progress, we have also an exponential uh, increase in investment in certain areas, like in AI. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about spillovers. Okay, and I will say later what spillover uh, means. Uh, so, um, AI is a very uh, hot area. Uh, we say we saw that. I mean, there is a huge increase in the number of papers published about using AI methods, at least in one area biology, etc. We see that there is a huge increase in the investment in AI techniques and methods to create companies, to build innovations. And then uh, how does this scientific progress affect other areas? Like progress in AI affects biology, affects uh, what else? So, I mean, these three people, do you, uh, the, these names, uh, Hinton, Benkio, Lekun, I don't know if they tell you something. These guys got the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, uh, a few years back in 2019. And this is uh, Demis Hasapis, who is uh, half Cypriot and is, uh, uh, I mean, a guy behind a uh, uh, company called DeepMind. Now, the story of these guys, there is a very nice book, uh, Genius Makers, by Kate Metz. And uh, he has also published uh, uh, some articles. He was uh, chief uh, editor, I think, in Wired. So he published some article about what these guys did. So these guys, basically, they started working decades ago uh, in uh, this area, which is called neural networks and uh, deep learning. Okay, and that's why they got the uh, the three of them, uh, they got uh, the Turing Award uh, uh, recently. So these guys were working for many, many years, for many decades, without, uh, uh, without uh, uh, doing, uh, sorry, um, yeah, okay, without, you know, uh, being very prominent, and um, also, Demis Hasapis uh, was interested in uh, doing computer games. So he liked computer games, so he developed uh, computer games. He developed systems to play computer games. And in 2016, uh, he created a, a program that played Go. Uh, Go is uh, uh, a game that is, it's, not, it's like it's, uh, you play it, uh, it's a Chinese game, okay? 
it's much more difficult than uh, chess. And uh, it's, uh, it's really popular in Asia. Uh, so what, uh, um, what he, he did was that uh, in 2016, the, the game, uh, his uh, software managed to win the European Master in Go. Okay. So it was the first time that uh, a software uh, beat uh, uh, someone who was uh, like a champion in Go, and that was like a, uh, f you know, a, a moment of truth for at least uh, Chinese people who uh, really have a lot of uh, respect for uh, the masters of Go because it's a very uh, difficult game. So if you say, okay, great, uh, he, he did the, in 2016 uh, software that uh, beat Go, uh, so, uh, what's in for us? Uh, well, uh, he beat Go using deep learning, and then uh, a few years after that, in 2020, these techniques uh, were used to produce uh, antibi antibiotics to, to, de to design an anti antibiotic in a completely different approach than uh, people used to design and develop antibiotics. Okay, and then uh, in 2020, uh, DeepMind announces uh, that uh, their software uh, solved the protein folding problem. The protein folding problem was like the most important problem in, bio in uh, biology. So what is the protein folding? is the effort to be able to predict protein structure uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the atoms that uh, constitute a protein molecule. Okay, how can you uh, predict the 3D structure of the protein, which from is the DNA sequence that encodes? Yes, which is determined by the molecule. Uh, but when you produce the molecule, this is just a sequence. Now, this sequence folds somehow. The folding is, uh, is very important because it determines the functionality of the protein. Uh, but no one can really uh, understand why a protein folds in a certain way and predict its folding. Okay? Uh, so, uh, that was in uh, 2020. They announced that alpha fold their alpha fold technology, which predicted protein uh, structure with accuracy comparable to experimental methods, where the experimental method you take the molecule and then you try to, uh, you know, to look it, let's say, through a very strong, uh, not a very strong microscope, through various techniques to re realize what is the structure. Uh, so the, the genomes, uh, this is from uh, a famous uh, biologist, says the genomes we believed were blueprints for life and were effectively encrypted. This uh, uh, invention uh, will unlock them and transform biological and biomedical research. And actually, uh, sorry, my... And there are a lot of other uh, papers that are coming out after 2020 where uh, you have this, uh, uh, this kind of technology affecting mathematics, uh, affecting uh, 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 materials, uh, and so on. Okay? And uh, more recently, uh, you have ChatGPT. <coughs> As if you know the protein folding, the solution of the protein folding was not uh, enough. Then you have chat. Uh, how many of you have used Chat GPT? Okay, so fifty percent or sixty percent. So if you used Chat GPT, then you realize that's I mean, unbelievable. And then since the announcement of Chat GPT which was in November, there are how many announcements uh, by other companies, that was from OpenAI, now we have a lot of other announcements of similar, uh, uh, similar models that uh, you can ask them things and they can uh, do reasoning, they can write code, etc. So it's really 
a, a huge uh, a huge uh, invention. Okay, so I think we covered the, the why. Okay, why do we need a, a science park? Uh, so the the answer will be okay. Let's become the next Silicon Valley. Understand we don't have too much time, so I will uh, stop uh, here. Now the question is how. Uh, and uh, the take-home message is that uh, a lot of uh, countries and a lot of people try to uh, copy uh, what Silicon Valley did. Uh, but Silicon Valley of today is not the Silicon Valley that produced uh, all these innovations that were using the mobile phone, the computers, the internet, etc. And we have to go back to uh, how the Silicon Valley uh, was when it started and realize uh, what are the, the key uh, concepts and the key uh, values that led to the Silicon Valley. But maybe we can do this in another lecture. So, okay. any questions? Comments? Okay, so uh, thank you very much.